I became friends with Lewis and Mary Leakey, ultimately cooperated in work with Richard Leakey much later in time and so on in the 60s and 70s, right? But we were, we were close friends. Lewis used to stay with us in Chicago at our house when he was in the States and in Chicago. And, uh, sometimes I would introduce him at lectures and whatever things. And, so, okay. yeah. and you, you found uh, working with uh, the Leakey family in general, you found them, uh, so it, it seems like you found them both personally uh, engaging and friendly oh, yeah. and, and intellectually stimulating? Uh, yeah, they were accepting, accepting of me and I was, it was always shop talk and things like that, of course, which is what interested me, the experience that people had, the, the, the life they had that I could learn about from sharing with them and so on. So, so it, was, it was sort of Africa in depth through them and so on. And that's been more or less true of others, and not so much so um, that I've known in Africa. But that they were especially so because it was for such a long period of time, Mary. Okay. Now, and tying that in with um, one interesting thing you said about um, the, the Africa trip is that it gave you access to unpublished ideas and materials and, yeah, and sure. uh, talking with people. So was that um, uh, eventually, as you get to know people that are, that are doing this work in Africa and the fact that, as you said, Africa is still considered sort of a dark continent at this time and not a lot is known about the... Uh, the, the fossils and the, the finds that are coming out of, uh, of Africa. So were people um, starting to use each other as sounding boards uh, for ideas and were they willing to talk, to talk to you about ideas that they weren't ready to publish? That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that before. Um, well, the first thing to say is Africa is really a huge place. And uh, just using the term Africa as opposed to Europe or something like that is, can give a very uh, much of a misleading kind of color to something. Uh, I, th I think what you have to th think of about Africa is its vastness from north to south. Uh, many degrees of latitude, um, that it's of different ages in terms of settlement, occupation, and so on, with uh, South Africa being older in a number of ways because it's Dutch, early Dutch settlement and so on, and the far north uh, along the coast of the Mediterranean being very different because it's always been part of the Mediterranean basin and so places that like Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Libya, uh, etc., Egypt, of course, they're, they're part of they're part of a very special part of of Africa that has has nothing to do with Africa south of the Sahara, in a way, in, in, in a truly in a way. So, also you have the difference between the French part, uh, which is in the north and the west. Uh, all French culture, French language, French science, French everything. And you have the part of both South Africa uh, plus Eastern Africa, uh, where it's English, uh, English colonial, and uh, colonial uh, in a very big, far-flung empire, and run in a very different way. And the question is, how do these people get together? And uh, in 1947, actually the year that I began going to university after military service, actually a meeting of a Pan-African Congress on prehistory was organized by Louis Leakey in Nairobi. And people came from all over for that meeting. It was published about uh, four years later, I guess. Um, very much edited down, brief, uh, not long papers in a, in a proceedings volume, but in a barely published 
uh, form with uh, very short contributions. But you can get an idea of the diversity of people from south to north and from east to west and different languages and so on. And um, that had a, that set a tenor, thanks to Louis Leakey and subsequently other people picking it up, uh, for other such meetings of the Pan-African Congress on prehistory. Later it became on prehistory and quaternary studies, or if you wish, Ice Age studies. Um, and um, the second one was held in Algiers, for example, in, in 52. And then subsequently in the Canary Islands, under Spaniards, and, and under in the Belgian Congo, 59 in Kinshasa, which, which uh, used to be called Leopoldville, uh, etc. Still going. Uh, it skipped some years. It's gotten bigger. It's got more diversified. Um, it's gotten more inclusive in the sense that it includes things into the later prehistory, proto-history, almost history of Africa. Uh, well, that's inevitable and so on. But, but Louis Lee recognized this need and anyone who knew much about Africa or to try to cross it or to f cross it from east to west, I mean, it was a huge distance if you tried to fly from uh, Djibouti on the Red Sea to Lagos or something like that in um, West Africa. It's a huge distance. And if you go from north to south, and you want to drive from from the Cape to Cairo on the famous Great North Road, as as the British called it. Uh, you're talking about a lot of driving and a lot of trouble, and uh, and there is no assurance that there's continuity between this strip of track and that strip of track, wherever it may be. I mean, there's nothing in between. There's no 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 blacktop highway. None of these things. Communications were a very major problem, and that was still manifest. To, that was certainly manifest when I first went to Africa, and 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 up until some years, it's less so now, depending on where you are. But of course, the infrastructure in Africa has deteriorated unbelievably uh, outside of colonial powers. Sorry to say that's the case, but that's the way it is. It's true, and. Um, so, so there's a real problem of communication and so on. Now, people did share many things with me. Uh, these things included access to archaeological collections that had been made and never analyzed or things that were under study. Um, so I did a variety of things. I, I did quite a bit of work when I was in Pretoria later on fossil, uh, Australopithecine fossils that were being discovered and reported and taken out of the ground by Robert Broom and later his assistant John Robinson. He became a friend of John Robinson's. Later he was invited to Chicago a, uh, for a term to teach uh, in the States and so on. Uh, and he was doing his doctor's dissertation on um, the dentition as I remember, the dentition of, uh, of Australopithecus species. And so some things I was able to, I was able to study almost everything there. And some things I was able to study less because he was involved with the more. But in general, he was fairly understanding. And I spent three and a half weeks there, so I was at the beginning of... Um, well, he'd been there since 1949, when he'd come from Cape Town as a zoologist. And um, I was there at the time when C.K. Brain was beginning all his work on, on the cave fillings and what it might mean as to how they got filled, the composition of the bone, uh, the 
the composition of the fauna as indicated by the bone and the sedimentary conditions leading to the infill of these um, karstic cavities, how the sediments got in them and how the bones got in the sediments and all this sort of thing. He wrote a wonderful thesis later, which was published by the University of Chicago Press, actually. All right. So uh, I was quite... Everywhere I went, something was happening in different ways. Um, sometimes there were younger people like these people. Um, in other instances, there was they were they were few on the ground, and there was other people, a few other people, functionaries, guys who were doing archaeological things under the bureaucracy of the government for permits and 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 protection protection of sites so they wouldn't be raided.